Shalom, shalom, shalom to everyone. Good morning. This is Rabbi Moshe Otero, Ways of Israel. And we're going to continue with our studies of Sefer Haikarim. And in today's class, we're going to take a look at something unique in which that God's divine laws can never be changed. No. And we're going to take a look at that. The, the fact that when God commands, those commands are unchangeable. And so the question that arises by Rabbi uh, Joseph Alba, whether some of the commandments in particular can be changed or altered or put away. Now we saw in the last video, which I recommend everyone watching it, uh, to take a look at it, that in fact there are two commandments in which, which not even the prophets can change. And those are the two, first two commandments regarding the, the belief in God and to, to substitute God by another God person or light, which makes the whole issue of, of the commandment in comparison or in relationship to Christianity a major issue. Because the very moment you replace the idea of God and you make him into a man and you worship the man instead of the, the, the you might say, the, the divinity of God or God, then it becomes a false notion or false religion. So please take a look at the video that I had uh, put together yesterday regarding this same topic. So let's go into today's uh, learning lessons in the Shir. And we're now in book number 3, chapter 19 of Sefer Karim. And Rabbi Abba begins from what we have said. It is clear that the divine law cannot change in respect to three general principles which we mentioned. For when they heard the first two commandments from God, they were convinced of the reality of the revelation and the existence of God who gave the commandments. Also that he takes notice of and punishes those who transgresses his will, while he rewards those who fear him, freeing them from bondage as they saw how he punished the Egyptians and delivered the Israelites. The expression that we read, who brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, shows to the extent the divine providence, from which we conclude that we must not worship anyone else, even as a mediator. And this is contained in the expression, and thou shalt have no other gods before me. As we have seen, it is clear, therefore, as we have written in the 25th chapter of the first book, that the difference between the divine law does not lie in their general principles. What still remains is to be explained is whether or not other commandments in the law of Moses may be changed by a prophet or not. Now, as there is a difference between the first two commandments and the others, in that the former were spoken by God without mediation of Moses, while the latter, though, though heard from God, were explained by Moses, so we can say that there is a difference between the Ten Commandments and the other pre precepts that's in, the, in that Ten Commandments, which we hear, which were heard from, from God, whereas the, other, the others were commanded by Moses. And as we have found that the, the last eight commandments of the Decalogue may be changed by a prophet temporarily, not permanently. And so we may say that the other precepts of the Mosaic Law can be changed by a prophet even permanently. And it is for this reason that they should abolish counting the month from the month of Nisan in the time of the Second Temple by the command of Jeremiah, as we have seen. But if it were true that any prophet or anyone who professes to be a prophet is authorized to change uh, any commandments of the divine law except those of the Decalogue or to say that the time has come to change it, the entire law would fall and it would have no permanence at all. On the other hand, if we say that no prophet has the right to change the commandments of the divine law given by another prophet, it would cause grave difficulty for if this were the case, then why did Israel believe Moses when he changed the Nochian law, which they had received by a condition or continuous tradition from their ancestors and who were prophets? In other words, what did the law of Moses do to the previous law? In other words, the universal laws that all humanity was uh, required to accept or, or follow. It was changed was changed to the Mosaic Law. 
And thus this changes, moreover, which Moses introduced, did not concern merely the details of conventional and positive rule, or matters which are relative to the recipient, or those things in which the nation may differ, and which differentiates one divine law from another, as we have explained in the first book, says Rabbi Albo, but they concerned also those matters in which human con convention plays no part, like the laws concerning the red heifer, or the sowing of mixed seed, or the permission to eat a uh, an animal as soon as slaughtered, though it's not yet dead and other things permitted to Israel which had been forbidden to the Noachites, to those who basically considered children of Noah. As we find in the chapter of Arba Mitot, for example, the law that a heathen who observes the Sabbath, and here heathen refers to a non-Jew, a pagan who observes the Sabbath is guilty of death, and so on. All of this would indicate that a thing which is commanded by a prophet in divine law may be changed by another prophet. How then can we tell what things may be changed or abolished by a prophet and what things may not be changed? Now keep up in mind as Rabbi Alba makes mention, make reference to the Noahide, Noahide laws. These were laws that were well established way before the Mosaic law and it's understood had precedence to that generation or that period of time. And when the laws of Moses was made applicable to the children of, of, of Israel, these laws were on a higher level in the sense that those things that were forbidden to the Noahides were in some cases permitted to Israel. For example, uh, and, and Rabbi Abba mentioned this, that when they slaughtered an animal, they would have to wait until all the limbs were considerably lifeless. There could not be any life in the animal. And, and thus, the Israelites were not so permitted. Uh, in other words, commanded. They can still eat as long as the slaughter was done in a way that's committed, com considered permissible even though some of the limbs were still alive they were able to cut and eat there's cook it and eat it so obviously there was a big difference between the mosaic law and that of the Noahide law and as we heard Rabbi Abba say that even if a heathen a non-Jew who observes the Shabbat he would be considered guilty of death penalty and so on so here I raise the questions to those among the, quote, new movement of the Noahide movements, and I ask you, if you want to keep the Sabbath, then convert to Judaism. And this is what's required, because if not, you'll be considering stealing something which belongs to the children of Israel. And so we see the very expression and will of God that God wants for the hum humanity to all follow God's law according to the levels that they're at. And most people who want to dabble into the Noahide observance really don't want to stay as a Noahide. They want to be a Jew. And thus when obstacles are placed in front of them as a deterrent for conversion, it becomes a major, major of sin. Because God is the one that's bringing them to the children of Israel to be part of this people. All of this would indicate that a thing which is commanded by a prophet in the divine law may be changed by another prophet. How then can we tell what things may be changed or abolished by a prophet or what things may not? Or our opinion therefore is that as a matter it appears as an investigation of the Torah that one is not permitted to budge from the traditional belief which came down to him by a continuous change of communication. Going back to the teaching of a prophet, provided that he is convinced of this principle, the fundamentals and derivatives of the belief in the questions are true. As we explain in the first book of this treatise, unless he is absolutely certain that God desires to abolish the words of the first prophet from whom the traditional belief came down to, to him. Now, interesting, I remember speaking one time with a person who is a non-observant Jew, completely secular in every, in every level, but they felt a sense of pride because they felt they were Jewish and they didn't have to listen to any laws. 
And I wanted to remind them that even humanity is required to keep at least seven. And a non-Jew who basically is not even keeping any of the commandments that was given to the children of Israel as a covenant would do well to understand that at least seven they should keep, which they do, do not. The manner in which one can have this latter certainty is by having an absolute verification of the genuine character of the, of the second divine messenger. The proof, this proof cannot consist in performance of miracles. In other words, we don't rely on miracles of the performer of miracles to verify that this messenger is from God. Since we have, we see many other persons who are not prophets performing miracles, either by creating an illusion or by magic, like the Egyptian magicians, or through some or other art form. Moreover, in the art form referring to the magics, not referring to painting. Moreover, we find that those prophets who do not, who are not sent to announce a law, also performs miracles. Hence, we cannot tell whether the miracle performed by the person is in question shows that he has been sent to promulgate a law, or whether it merely indicates that he's a prophet. It is clear that a miracle is no proof that the messenger is genuine, as as was explained in the 18th chapter of this first book. But the proof must be derived from the law of Moses for the reason given in the 11th chapter of the first book. Accordingly, if his mission is proved to be the same as that of, of what Moses, it is proper to listen to the second prophet, even if he desires to abolish the precept of the first. So you can't, um, you can't abolish what was previously unless you, you abide by what is present. In this case, now the Mosaic law. This is the reason why the Israelites believed the words of Moses, even though in some precepts were opposed to the Nochian law, as we said before, which they knew by tradition as divine. But they were absolutely convinced that God desired to promulgate a law through Moses, else they would have not been the right to budge from their tradition. From the law which came down to them, by an unbroken tradition from the ancestors going back ultimately to Adam and Noah. This condition was reached in two ways. Notice please what Rabbi Abba says. He brings it all the way up to Noah. He doesn't push the issue of Abraham of Enu, who was then became the father of many nations and the father of the Jewish people, the Israelites. The conviction was reached in two ways. They felt certain that the last prophet who was introducing changes was greater than the first. And they verified the genuineness of the last prophet's mission as firmly as the first. Moreover, uh, these kinds of proof applied absolutely in, in, Mo in Moses' case. He was a greater prophet than those who lived before him. For he performed wonderful miracles such as never been performed before. The Bible makes this clear when he says, And I appeared to, unto Abraham. Notice everything starts with Abraham on forth, going forth. Uh, Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But my name, yud -Heh -Vav -Heh, I made me not made made me not known to them. They did not know the the sacred name. The meaning is that God revealed himself to Moses with his great name by means of which he was able to perform miracles openly and publicly. Changing the laws of nature, such as had never been done for earlier prophets, would only perform invisible miracles to deliver them from the death in time of famine and from the, the sword in time of war. The mission of Moses was verified because all of Israel heard the voice speaking to Moses as the Bible says. The people may hear that when I speak with thee, for I desire to promulgate the law through thee. I want you to hear this again, please. Because the idea of promulgation of the law, in a sense, is to let other people know. It is, in fact, the verse that indicates that God's desire of doing proselytization, proselytizing others to the law became very important even to the time, during the time of Moses. That the people may hear when I speak with thee, for I desire to promulgate a law through thee, and this will I make them believe what thou says. For this reason Israel was obliged to believe his words. 
even though he were to abolish all of that that was said by the prophets before him. In other words, to abolish the seven universal laws for Israel. It does not apply to Israel. Since his mission was verified, and we explain this in the 18th chapter of the first book, and his prophetic guide or grade was superior to all of the rest, as we explained in the chapter 10 of the book. Whether in, uh, in the future there may come another prophet who will abolish the words of Moses and in whom we shall be obliged to believe, this can only happen, this can ha happen only, as we have said, in one of two ways. Either the new prophet will be proved to be greater than Moses, or his mission will be verified as that of Moses. Now the Bible says that there can be there cannot be a prophet greater than Moses. So here, Christian and other messianic groups have a big problem because even their quote unquote Christ is not considered greater than Moses to contradict what this says. If there be a prophet among you, I the Lord do make myself known unto him in a vision. And my servant Moses is not so. He is trusted in all of my house with him. Do I speak the mouth to mouth? And it seems that when Moses' prophecy is superior to any others, and at the end of the Torah we read that there will never arise another prophet like Moses, whom God knew face to face. Never. Not even the Messiah. This is a degree which Moses asked for and was granted to him, as we read at the end of the Torah. And there hath not arisen a prophet since Israel like Moses, like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. He does not say this of the Messiah to come or of a future prophet that he would have bring up as Messiah. And thus, this idea is presented in the Christian literature as quintessential in proving that that person is a Messiah and which is not necessary. Therefore, if any prophet or anyone prophesying to be a prophet should come and say that he has attained a high grade greater than Moses, which is impossible, and should say that we should listen to him and abolish any of the commands of Moses, not as a temporary measure merely, we will refuse to listen to him which was the, my message from the last video. This is the reason why all of Israel does not accept neither Jesus nor any other one that came through the Jewish history indicating to be the Messiah or the anointed one giving us or giving over a new commandment. Not even um, Muhammad. So thus, this is the reason why the children of Israel don't pay attention to the words of Jesus or the words of Muhammad because they're not superior to that of Moses but rather inferior and thus we have an obligation to not listen to them but we'll tell you that when we prove his superiority to Moses and all the prophets who came after him and all who were the, his disciples by performing miracles greater and more wonderful than those performed by Moses and other prophets by humiliating all of those who dispute with him as Moses did to Korah and his assembly by triumphing triumphing, uh, triumphing over and overcoming all of the wise men of his age and all of his opponents as Moses did to Pharaoh and to all the magicians and wise men of Egypt by performing miracles in public and the presence of the people as Moses did in the presence of Pharaoh and all of Israel and by maintaining miracles as long uh, for a long time as Moses caused to go the people a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night and caused manna man to come down for 40 years without ceasing except on Shabbat day when it did not come down in order to show the sanctity of the Sabbath and the truth of his word and fulfilling many other conditions of this kind without which he cannot make a good as, as claim which is interesting when you compare um, the feeding of, 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 of hundreds of thousands of Israelites daily with the man for 40 years 
and you compare only one occasion where you have this figure of Christianity, Jesus, duplicating the bread and the fish for only one day to feed 5,000 people, and people go, wow. Imagine the level of Moses, which Jesus never attained, which was feeding not 5,000, but hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Israelites, at least certainly a half a million for sure. And this he was doing by the hand of God in the desert for 40 years. This is truly a miracle of miracles. This is why no other can be uh, made equal or greater than Moses. The reason the Israelites obeyed Jeremiah and abolished the counting of the month of Nisan, as we have seen, it was per perhaps because they based their actions upon the interpretation of the biblical verse as we find in the Tosafot on the first chapter of the treaties of Megillah. The Megillah, the reason Ezra changed the written characters which he returned from exile was because it was of his interpretation of the Bible verse, which says, And he shall write him a copy of this law, which is Torah Mishnah. And he interpreted to mean a writing that is destined to change Mishneh, the rabbinic Shana, to change. Or it may be that the, you know, they obey Jeremiah because his precepts did not concern any of the Ten Commandments, or because there was no intention to abolish any of the Mosaic Commandments, but to commemorate the second redemption as they commemorated the first. For they had a tradition that it should be com com commemorated, provided that the exodus from Egypt should not be ignored. As the rabbis say, not that the exodus from Egypt should be entirely removed. But if a prophet, or one professing to be a prophet, should come and say that he has been sent by God to promulgate a law, abolishing permanently the words of Moses, he must not be believed. Which, by the way, this is the argument that, that Alba makes against the whole entire Christian um, theological world. That, in fact, this Jew did not abolish the Torah or the laws of Moses. If anyone had any type of cycle in the Christian world would understand that when, when Jesus had said that I have not come to change the law, but to fulfill it, to put it into practice, completely speaks damnable against today's Christianity. Jesus was all about not abolishing, but enforcing or affirming what he understood to be the, the laws of Moses. And thus anyone who does the opposite must not be believe nor his message accepted and can be completely rejected. So far as concerned the Ten Commandments, since they were heard by, from God, but rather must be believed in respect to the other commandments outside the Decalogue unless he can verify his mission as Moses verified his. And as you see, Jesus could not verify his, his mission, ne neither as a prophet. This is why sometimes I get upset with some of my fellow Jews, because they, they equate Jesus as being a prophet. He's not a prophet, not even at the level of Moses. And he cannot be verified as a Messiah. He was never anointed. He was never coronated. He was never made by the instruments of Jewish law, this, and by the way, he would have to be sub, uh, submit to the process of, of a protocol according to Jewish law. But as for thee, stand thou here by me, and I will speak unto thee all the commandment, and statutes, and the ordinance, which thou shalt teach them. Literally, the, the words of the Torah, the commandments and instructions were orally taught by Moses to the children of, the, of Israel, to the great assembly. And they passed that down to their children and their children's children. And that became a Messorah. It became a tradition. This is the reason why God revealed himself to all of Israel and spoke to them face to face in order that Moses' mission should be absolutely verifiable or verified. And by the way,
this same aspect of having to be uh, approved before the children of Israel must be then again repeated for Mashiach to be able to do the same thing and that can be said that even Mashiach will, will speak to God face to face as God spoke to Israel face to face and thus it needs to be repeated not diminuated and therefore all the previous could have been, should have been, would have been never arrived at this level and therefore God said to Moses Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with thee and may also believe thee forever. The meaning is that God said to Moses and he desired to reveal himself to him face to face despite the fact that he, Moses, was in a thick cloud. He was wrapped in coarseness, in obscurity of matter, unworthy of such dignity for the sake of two advantages to follow. One was in reference to the immediate present, namely, that the people may hear when I speak with thee and obey all of his commandments even though even even if they oppose to the Nochian law it means the seven universal laws in other words uh, the children of Israel goes beyond the laws of Noah the other concerned the future that they should believe in Moses forever not as God not as divinity but as simply a messenger of God this is what Christianity really did wrong. They made a man into a God and not a mere messenger of God. And hence, they will not listen to any prophet who may come to abolish the words of Moses unless they hear from God that he was sent for that purpose. For to obey a prophet and permanently violate the Mosaic commandment like Christianity does is like obeying a prophet and violating that which one had heard from God himself. So who do you listen to? Do you hear from God himself? Or do you listen to a prophet telling you to go and disobey what God said? In such a case, one must not obey a prophet, not even a messenger of God, if he so claims himself to be a messenger of God. It is for a thing of this kind that the prophet Edo was punished by being devoured by a lion because he obeyed another prophet and violated that which he heard himself from God. It is clear therefore that we must believe no one. Yes, no one. This is why the stigma of many Jews having the, the, the stigma of being unbelievers has remained because we don't believe the bubba meisters of other prophets that go against God's word. And whether he be a prophet or one professing to be a prophet, if he says that he was sent by God to abolish the words of Moses and that no longer applies, or if he says that they are temporary and the time has come for the abolition, unless his mission can be proven as publicly as the mission of Moses was proved in the presence of 600,000 people who Moses fed for 40 years plus, you have to understand why we, the children of Israel, completely can disobey even a person like Jesus and say, no, you are not following the, the, the procedures that the Torah, that God himself established. As to the question of whether there will ever be in the future such a great publicity as the first, when all of Israel will hear the voice of the Lord speaking to them out of the midst of the fire and the opinions of our rabbis is that there will be such an event. And thus we read in the Midrash Hazit on the biblical verse, Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Meshika says Rabbi Yehuda, when the Israelites heard the first two commandments of the Torah was impressed upon their minds and they learned without forgetting they came to Moses and said to Moses, our teacher, you will be messenger between us, as is said, speak thou with us, and we will hear. And thereupon, thereupon they learned and later forgot. They said then, as Moses, who is made of flesh and blood, is temporary, so is his teaching temporary, and it's forgotten. And hence they went back to Moses and said, we should wish that God would reveal himself to us again. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, said Moses in the reply. Now 
Not now, but in the future he will, as it says. And this is the promise, that God will speak to the children of Israel once again, face to face, and I will put my law in their inward parts. This is the Berit Fadisha, which means a very direct revelation from God to the people. And it is clear from this that the rabbis are of the opinion that in the future, all of Israel will experience a second revelation like the first, which will come directly from God without any mediation. In other words, God will reveal himself publicly to the children of, of Israel, and there will be no need of anyone mediating in between or go-between. We go direct, and God says the children of Israel come direct. We have a direct connection. And God says he's going to do it again. He's going to reveal himself and his commandments directly. He's going to put that from within our, our being. My own opinion, says Rabbi Albo, is that since does not necessarily follow from an interpretation of biblical verses, it is more proper to say that this matter depends upon the will of God, accordingly to the Torah. It belongs neither to the category of the necessary, nor does it, uh, nor to that of the impossible. Our position at present is the fact that a prophet who heard something from God, he must not listen to any other prophet who advises him to act contrary to the command he himself received from God. So one of the basic rules of all prophets is you obey the voice of God as a prophet that spoke to you. Don't guide yourself by other prophets or preachers of God's message. Unless he hears himself, hears to the same effect from God. Even if he can verify the mission of a new prophet, as the mission of Moses was verified, we will refuse to listen to him if he bids us to abolish any of the Ten Commandments which we ourselves heard from God. So this way, not only he summarizes the first two commandments, but he says if he, uh, he denies any of the Ten Commandments, not only including the first two that all of Israel heard directly from the, the very mouth of God, but any of the other Ten Commandments, we will not accept Him, we will not receive Him, and we will reject His message, and He as a messenger of God. In this way, we're going to reply to our opponents who argue, and again, I'm saying this is exactly what the Christians would say to the Jews as they were forcing them to convert to Christianity, and this is what Rabbi Abba was responding to his opponents who argue from the verse in the Torah that says, And I will rise them up a prophet from among like their brethren, like unto thee. And I will put my, my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I command him. This verse signifies that they say that a law will be given through a new prophet, and as it was given through Moses, also from among their brethren. And it means from the brethren of Israel, and not from Israel itself. Our reply to these men is that granting that, according to the verse quoted, a prophet will come to give a law, as Moses did before the expression. And I will raise them up a prophet, like unto thee. Signifies that his raising up and the verification of his prophetic mission, which is a fundamental dogma, divine law, as we have seen, must be the same kind as verification of Moses and his prophetic mission, which took place in the presence of 600,000 people, so that there was no doubt and no suspicion of any kind, which is one of the things I've kept on saying. You don't need to worry about the Mashiach. You don't need to boggle yourself down as to whether he is or he isn't. Why? Because God himself will reveal to the children of Israel his messenger again. You need not to try to, 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 to qualify him or prove him to be for certain. God himself will do this. This is exactly the argument that Rabbi Albo is presenting to his fellow Jew, and in particular, to those who basically were arguing that Jesus was a brethren among them, but was not verified, was not proven to be uh, the, the, the lawgiver, and in fact did not raise him up to be a prophet. It was more of a symbol of a, 
anointed leader as a king, in which he failed at that as well. And I will challenge any Christian, any Messianic, any Nazarene, that can show me that Jesus was anointed by the process of the royal anointing of a descendant of David. Those will say, well, you know, during this, the first century it was not necessary because the, the descendants were known and thus did not have to be proven. Once the Davidic throne was absent of someone sitting on the throne for X amount of years, and believe it or not, for many X amount of years, there was no Davidic dynasty ruling in Israel from the throne of David. As a matter of fact, that was the big sin that the 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 priesthood of the Sadducean Sedu era or Hasmonean era provided, which they prohibited and they deprived the right of all of the descendants of David to be able to rise in their throne and purposely refuse to establish the throne of David. They usurped the throne of David, the throne of which could have, would have, provided the Mashiach to be sitting down on the throne of David. But because of this, the whole Hasmonean priesthood were completely decimated, never to be ever again back in the history of the Jewish people. And it was a sad moment because had they done the right thing, had they established the throne of David, had they done that, perhaps we would not be even talking about this whole issue of regarding the, the supremacy of Moses in comparison to that of the Mashiach that is yet to come. And thus we see that Rabbi Albo established the precedence very clear that you don't need to try to prove who the Mashiach or God's messenger will be. That's up to God and God's doing. So every single one wanting Mashiach, nice feeling, nice sentiment, we should want and await every day, but it's not incumbent upon you to establish who the Mashiach is, when he will come, and what he will do, but it is clearly explained by our leaders in the in the past that he must be a prophet like among you like 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 Moses and must qualify as Moses was verified to the children of Israel six hundred thousand plus now you're talking about a lot of children here and yet neither Jesus neither Shabbatai V neither any of the the potential messiahs of our history ever reached and fulfilled the verification. Even the most recent one, the many are still saying he is the Mashiach. He's not. He was not even the potential Mashiach. He could have been, he would have been, but he wasn't, he isn't. Because God did not verify his status as greater than Moshe. Even if you were to say that he was the Moshe of our generation, he wasn't. There is no proof of that he was verified as the level of the Moshe of our generation. And this is kind of hard to say because the very moment you say that so-and-so is the Moshe of our generation, you are equating him to be a prophet and you're equating him to be the Mashiach of our generation, the leader of the generation. But we understand the same desire that in every generation there is a Moshe Rabbeinu. But does not mean necessarily that that person has arrived and been verified by God as the Moshe Rabbeinu of our days? Just the opposite. Verification and fulfillment by God did not take place and thus was removed from the face of the earth as were all the previous ones that could have been should have been and would have been. I know these are hard words, but we need to come to the realization that we're still yet without the promised Mashiach. And we hope and pray that God, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, be the one to send him and verify him among the children of Israel. And then the true, 
true redemption of the children of Israel will take place in our times and hopefully during our period and moment in history. This is Rabbi Moshe Otero with the Ways of Israel wishing you and yours a wonderful week and may God bless you and strengthen you in all things. Shalom.